Amano-san, you like to try and ambush people, right? Do I? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Go away, 2014. Nobody likes you. If the video game industry were a game of dodgeball, you'd be the kid who gets picked the very last. You know, the man tittied little dipshit who smells like pee and claims his dad works at Nintendo, which is saying something considering the commercial and critical shiceberg the industry struck during the year that preceded it. For 2014 to be considered a disappointment under those circumstances is a kind of uselessness only Robin Quivers can truly understand. Well, the mountain is high, but the middle fingers are erect, so let's sift through the wreckage and emerge with the top five turds of 2014. More broken than the American monetary system and predicated on twice the vapid hype, the ferris wheel of futility that is the belabored Assassin's Creed series has come around for yet another annual rotation, this time with its very first bona fide, and let's dust off those Dr. Evil air quotes here, first true next-gen experience championed as its selling point. And if Watch Dogs has taught us anything, it's that first true next-gen experience is Ubisoft corporate code for same shit, different year, half the depth, twice the glitches. And Jesus nipple-twisting Christ did they ever deliver on the aforementioned glitches. This game is buggier than a meth addict's peripheral vision. Glitches are one thing. Lemmy knows I had to endure my, and for that matter, your share of the bastards when I recently reviewed the latest Dragon Age title, but enduring even 15 adjacent minutes of characters repeatedly falling through the floor into the nebulous blue void, guards spontaneously imploding into a mangled mass of shuddering limbs, or your standard McDefault protagonist finding himself repeatedly snagged on thin air is enough to send Max Headroom into epileptic fits. But one place you needn't fear overstimulation is with a narrative that amounts to a sensory deprivation tank. After roughly a dozen games, the Ubisoft Montreal studio finally has an excuse to openly indulge their latent, shall we say, Franco-centric underpinnings by exploring the fascinating historical stage of the French Revolution and what the fuck does that amount to? French Ezio, magging with bitches who may or may not have skin on their fucking faces amid the impressive threat of a French governmental power struggle with all the unbridled urgency of an all-snail 500-meter dash, or as Ubisoft call it, fast food. As the shambling corpse that is this series inches deliberately forward, spurred exclusively by omnipresent hype and the ominous threat of shareholder revolt, one thing comes into crystal clarity. Assassin's Creed, at least in its present annual manifestation, is not a game. It's five games made by 15 studios with little to no central oversight haphazardly cobbled together at the 11th hour with flat zero regard for how each disparate conflicting element will assimilate into the product as a whole. And just when you think the direction can't get any more incongruous or misguided, another holiday season rolls by in its dilution time yet again. Motherfucker, you're diluting water at this point. This is game design, not homeopathic medicine. Consequently, all franchise identity has been utterly obliterated to the point that each successive entry has undergone more radical changes than the names tattooed on Kat Von D's impossibly flat ass. What began as a medieval pseudo-stealth adventure game is now a nautical tower defense online multiplayer parkour sim. And don't even get me started on the shameless copy-paste job of Assassin's Creed Rogue. Ubisoft, this is officially no longer a science experiment. Assassin's Creed is now a full-blown Frankenstein monster loose in the village, and the gamers are the seven-year-old girl calmly picking dandelions by the river. If you can peer through the haze of your own corporate myopathy, the Bavarian horde, replete with pitchforks and torches, are rapidly emerging on the horizon. You know how this story ends. Next. <laughs> Quite literally every worst of 2014 list I've been subjected to over the past month has fallen prey to the compulsory inclusion of Rambo the video game. And as much as my contrarian ass loves to buck a good trend, in this particular instance, there can be no arguing whatsoever with the popular vote. Haplessly marrying all the least playable elements of light gun titles like Time Crisis and House of the Dead with the worst turd-person tropes this side of fucking Starhawk into a 
feckless fusion of fail. I find it near impossible to sufficiently convey how profoundly I do not get how you could have possibly managed to fuck this up. Quite literally, all you had to do was remake Far Cry and replace Fohawk Von Kecky Pants with fucking Rambo. It would have been Game of the Goddamn Eon. You managed to fuck up the unfuckable. Look at the state of the first person genre right now, for fuck's sake. After enduring the unremitting barrage of brown and gray boredom with Call of Duty and Banalfield steadily regurgitating themselves into irrelevance, acquiring the Rambo license was your chance to provide the antithesis to all these faux realistic fuckwads. The chance to at last cast the player in the role of a lone, unkillable badass with exploding arrows and an endless supply of ammunition in one line or single-handedly massacring the entirety of the third world. Even if you were making a light gun game, a criminally underrepresented genre in 2014 for the record, you might have been able to pull it off if you had even the beginnings of a germ of an atom of a fucking clue what you were doing. What dyslexic Dr. Mengele slapped this control scheme together exactly? Aiming with a right stick that has more sensitivity issues than a so social justice blogger, four stealth sections that cannot, I repeat, cannot be conceivably fucked up by all but the most concussed patients in the head trauma ward? Now slap a Rambo license the developers spent literally every cent of their budget acquiring and what the fuck could possibly go wrong here? Stallone baby. Pro fucking tip. Where gaming is concerned, scrap the Rambos and the Rockies and the Judge Dreads and finally give us that open world urban video game adaptation of fucking Cobra. My lips will be wrapped around your cock in perpetuity. And speaking of which, avoid this game like Stallone avoids mentioning his first film. <laughs> You know, if I close my eyes, I can picture the scene in the boardroom of Square Enix Japan in pristine detail. Ladies and gentlemen, the 56-inch prototype 4K OLED TV. This revolutionary TV combines the world's largest OLED display with dazzling 4K resolution, including this beautiful <laughs> interface screen. Fuck, guys, I think Final Fantasy's dying on us. Our last two games sold like powdered water. Our new MMO is one of the biggest financial catastrophes in the history of gaming, and our ceaseless meddling in the Eidos branch has rendered the first two turds of our Western gaming divisions. We've cranked out one sequel to a bad game already, and it sold less than a third as many copies as the original. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? <laughs> Fuck, I got it. Make another sequel. Brilliant! Sorry, sorry, that's it. Who likes side quests? Well, fuck your shit. Here's SideQuest the video game. What's that? Doomsday clock counting down the microseconds to human extinction? Fuck that noise. Timmy Two Tits lost some oil flasks and half trench coat McDildo hair says his oleander bush needs a nice trim. Better do it. It's the only way to get EP and rather ironically, also the only way to momentarily pause said Doomsday clock. I'll take self defeating game design for 200, Alex. Simple Simon met a pie man. But at least the player's only emissary is an emotionally fallow fashion plate. If you listen closely, you can actually hear Lightning's voice actress counting down the seconds until Square Enix's check clears. More open-ended? Sure. Less linear? Absolutely. Playable? An improvement? Even remotely on the verge of being vaguely fucking entertaining? No, no, and hell no. Nah. Hey gang, beleaguered by action-y pseudo-horror like Dead Space 2 and 3, Resident Evil's run and gun big shit go boomifying, leave you more flaccid than Lance Bass at a wet t-shirt contest? Never fear, Shinji Mikami to the rescue. Pay no heed to the fact that his last several efforts made Michael Bay look like Stanley Kubrick, never mind that the seeds for the steady lobotomization in full bloom on Resident Evil 5 and 6 were in fact planted by Shinji Mikami on Resident Evil 4. Surely it's not all nostalgia. Surely Master Mikami will deliver us all from... <laughs> Don't call me Shirley. God damn it, Shinji, you had one job. Look, I get that some people dig this game, and given the alternative, I can understand perfectly why they might feel that way. Is it better than RE5 and 6? Sure, so is dragging your bare ass over broken beer bottles, but I'm not eager to retry that trick in the near future either. Hey, it was summer camp, I was impressionable, fuck off. But if you honestly think this aimless assortment of last-gen action horror cliché represents the rebirth of the survival horror titans of yore, well... 
you're just wrong and there's no two ways about it. This game is every bit as overblown, misguided, and perhaps even more poorly designed than the last several Resident Evil titles, and as someone who waited for this game with bated breath, it's physically painful to admit that out loud. While positively nailing the atmosphere of classic horror, virtually every other aspect of a superb and terrifying game experience has been botched to a Janice Dickinson facelift degree. Abominably placed checkpoints? We got them! AI that couldn't outflank a quadriplegic amoeba? Done and done. Ham-handed stealth mechanics with a roughly 50-50 success ratio? Fuck to the yeah. And let's not forget compulsory boss fights that make the original cut of Deus Ex Human Revolution look like a paragon of design subtlety. The Evil Within should have been the game to re-establish an entire horror genre, an obligation it thankfully pawned off onto the infinitely superior Alien Isolation in the same month. Instead, it became an obligatory survival horror title that Mikami pinched out in record time in order to fulfill a contract presumably so we could move on to a project he is actually in danger of giving a fuck about. Perhaps most sobering of all is that the misguided gaming press and sadly many fellow gamers fired frothing arcs of fanboy jism in unison all the same. The Evil Within? A rebirth? Yeah, try Afterbirth. While the initial reception may have been cartoonishly forgiving, I suspect as time wears on, The Evil Within will take its rightful place as one of the single most disappointing titles of the decade. And it might have taken the number one spot in 2014, if not for this. I don't know what to tell you, Rageaholics. The warning signs were there. Between the arbitrarily miscast voice actor, broiling rumors of internal political upheaval at Eidos Montreal, not to mention that open mouth insert loaded shotgun turbo cool placeholder logo for what I can only assume was a game entitled Theaf, that I still managed to come away from Eidos Montreal's first legitimately awful outing feeling pangs of genuine disappointment is a testament to unchecked developer ego and publisher interference. Believe me when I tell you that I expect the absolute worst. My bar was beyond lowered. That limbo stick was roasting a rotisserie chicken at the Earth's core, for fuck's sake, and yet you still managed to one-up my ready-made disappointment, which is why I found it particularly curious when every one of the game's defenders squatted and produced a half-dozen variations on the same steaming reply. Just don't think of it as a thief game, and you'll enjoy it, motherfucker! After hearing Romano Arzari snore his way through the early game teasers, after writhing in fits of epilepsy at that I'm not obnoxious screen flash when the player leaves shadow cover after hearing honest to god motherfucking dubstep in the trailer to a fucking thief game I was beyond desensitized. I was Helen Keller in a latex onesie folks. At that point I was basically just looking for a functioning start menu and something that could be vaguely construed as a game in the aftermath. Instead I get to play as Gollum Hands the Wonder Fart shambling his leather daddy looking ass through 12 of the most frustratingly linear intelligence insulting hamster cages wrought by the hands of man peering look comically through more theatrical fog than an Ingve Malmsteen stage setup waiting for the next contextual signpost to bear the listless plot to incompletion. And by listless, I mean a high dare you to give a fuck about this plot. So Edward Floppy Hands and his preteen bondage gimp fall on a magic pebble which turns her to the cranky broad from the ring and gives his left eye a flatulence problem. The magic pebble being a renewable source of fart cloud energy is being used by the vulture from Spider-Man to solve a crippling energy crisis that is painfully evident from the fact that even the poorest tenements in the city somehow have working electric fucking lights in them. Twelve levels later Floppy Hands fights Eyeshadow Cat in the battle for the least likable character of the century. Slapped together? I've read Bazooka G Joe comics with more convincing character arcs. Steven Gallagher should be fucking ashamed. But if there's a silver lining for fellow Taffords, it's that the sales certainly reflected the quality. I don't give a fuck how furiously Squeenix tried to spin Thief's abysmal sales into a positive. Half-retarded remedial fucking math students can connect the dots when after five years of prohibitively expensive AAA development, your fragrant shit pile of a game manages to sell less than a million units. Teeth, not merely Bad Thief, not merely an awful game, the worst sequel of the decade, and without question, the top turd of 20. 14, I'm Razorfist. God fucking speed.